Okay, so welcome everybody. So um, uh, this, this webinar, the aim of this webinar, as, as you know, is to just share some stories with you um, about the international links that are, are going on around our diocese. Um, many churches have international links. We've picked just a few today to share with you. Others you can read about on our website and in our newsletters. But there's some wonderful things going on of links between different parts of the world. Um, so we just wanted to give you a little taste of that this evening. Um, my name's Christine. I'm part of the Troa Diocese International Links Committee. And you'll see another Christine on your screen as well. And she's the, the chair of our, our committee. And we'll hear more from Christine later on. Um, other members of our committee I've, I've seen already are, are part of our some of our participants this evening. Um, but they're, they're not on screen with us tonight. Um, so yeah, before before we go any further, I think it'd be it'd be good to just open in prayer. So let's pray. Lord, we just thank you for this evening. We thank you for the speakers we have with us this evening, and we pray that you you bless them, and that you use them to share some of the exciting stories of what's happening between churches in the diocese of Truro and in other parts of the world. And Lord, we pray for this evening that you inspire those who are listening and watching and that you encourage them and maybe that you inspire them to, to begin something new in their parishes too. Lord, we just pray for your blessing on this evening. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so just to give you a little bit of background, the... Um, uh, in Truro Diocese, we have several links which are diocesan links. I've seen some of our attendees this evening are from uh, Mzimvubu in South Africa. We have a link with South Africa with the Diocese of Mzimvubu, um, mainly supporting um, children and vulnerable families in that area um, and supporting the diocese as they work to work with those, those vulnerable families. Um, we have a, another link with Lebanon, um, which we're just developing at the moment. We're hoping that, that soon we'll be able to go out and visit Lebanon and try and develop that link a little bit more. Um, and we also have a link with uh, the Lutheran Diocese of Strangnas in Sweden, um, which is a, a, a link that's been going on for, for quite some time now. And there've been various visits backwards and forwards. Um, and uh, yeah, so all, the, all of these links um, are diocesan level links, but today we're going to look at some links that different parishes around the diocese have developed themselves with different charities and organisations or simply from church to church, um, from Truro to other parts of the world. So if you want to hear more about our diocesan links, there is a webinar that we had in February, which uh, there was a recording of that on the website. Um, tomorrow you'll all receive an email from me and I'll send you the link to that previous webinar in the email um, so you can hear more about that. And there's also a, a third webinar that we, we did in February, which was all about different mission organisations that you can maybe link with in your church if you want to if set up a link with, with another part of the world. So I'll, I'll send you a link to that webinar as well if you want to find out more information about that. Okay, so um, tonight we've we've got uh, various speakers. Um, I'll introduce them one by one. Um, so the first, well, the first group of speakers that we have are going to be talking about a link with the Mercy Rescue Trust in Kenya. So we have Neil, who's from St. Key Church, and we have Claire, who's from Grand Pound Church, and both of those churches have links with the Mercy Rescue Trust. We also have Jadida, who is from Kenya, who works for the Mercy Rescue Trust in Kenya. Um, so I'm not sure what order they're going to speak, but the three of them are going to speak to us a little bit about that link and about what the Mercy Rescue Trust does. So over to you. Welcome. Thank you. Shall I, shall I speak first, guys? 
<laughs> I'll, um, I'll just give you a little bit of a history of the Mercy Rescue Trust because it didn't always start off as a church charity. It actually um, started with a friend of mine in the village who happened to go to my church. Um, her niece went out to uh, uh, Kenya, um, to Takana, when there were droughts in 2006, 2007. There was uh, a lot of um, cattle died, people died, and she went out with her father to help distribute aid. And when she was there, she was um, basically handed some babies who'd lost their parents. And um, so although the charity she went with, it wasn't really their, um, that wasn't their role. Um, she called upon her family to help raise money so that she could actually look after these um, babies. So that's how it all started. Um, but very quickly, we kind of started raising money just to keep, because she started with two babies, then it was three, then it was five. And then before she knew it, she was having to employ um, local people as well to help with 11 babies. Um, and then she moved down uh, within Kenya to Kitali, which is much more fertile. And, um, and that's where we set up a home. Um, and we only had to raise about a thousand pounds a month at that stage to keep it all going. Um, but very quickly, we realized that um, abandonment was a big issue within Kenya and even in Kitali where we were. Um, the charity has changed a lot since we've um, started back in 2006, 2007. And um, very quickly, my church came involved. Um, and about four or five years into the charity, we reached out to a couple of um, members of Key Church. And um, I think Neil will talk a little bit more about how those members of their church really helped um, set us on a, a more prof a professional footing. Um, as far as the actual um, baby rescue centre um, developed, it changed really when Jadida came on board about five, six years ago now, Jadida. <laughs> <laughs> and um, we decided that we were going to take the whole uh, charity away from um, a baby rescue centre where we were, you know, essentially an orphanage. Um, and we were going to do a lot of work into trying to um, strengthen those ties we already had with the, the, the extended families in Takana and try and unite most of our uh, children with back with their families um, which we did over a gradual period and we decided then that we were also going to find foster homes for every single baby that um, we looked after we weren't going to have an orphanage uh, that wasn't the um, where we felt it was right for children to grow up in an orphanage they needed to be with families and so we've taken on much more of social welfare role um, uh, uh, we have a social team which goes out finding the home, you know, looking, checking on homes, checking on the families, checking on them after they've gone to the families. Um, and I think we, I mean, we started off with uh, three babies and over the 13, 14 years we've been going, we've now um, found homes for over 250 uh, abandoned babies. Um, in, in terms of the way the churches have become involved, as people have gone out and heard about or have gone to Kenya anyway, and quite often met Jadida, seen what she's done, they've gone back to their own churches with information and they've come on board. So not only is it um, Grand Pound Creed now, it's now Key Church, we have Oasis Church, um, we have uh, Christ in uh, Parbold up in Wigan um, plus we've got churches in Switzerland and Jadida will probably tell you of a few more um, and when we have volunteered or gone over I've quite often met people from different churches and it's just been wonderful um, forming a network forming relationships with people um, not just within you know, your own church but churches you work with but also going out there and meeting people one thing that I'd always um, 
I saw and I still feel very much about life is that it is a tapestry that we're all threads and we weave together um, and the more people you meet and interact with the more colorful the design and I also feel that anything like a tapestry that takes it takes time to develop before you actually see what's happened and the great thing with being involved with Mercy Rescue Trust is it's not something where some churches will 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 say one year they'll give some money to a certain charity the next year another charity we've actually had a relationship with um, all the staff there who are, are pretty much haven't changed for a long period of time we've seen children grow up we've seen their lives change and it's actually for us from the point of view of what do we get um, from being part of this it's really life enriching seeing children who had been completely abandoned and and then having a a video link to them uh like I did the other day when I was uh, at home and they're 15 years old and they're thoroughly enjoying life they're confident and happy young people so it's been extremely rewarding but I'll I'll pass over to perhaps Jadida who will tell you a little bit more um, about what we do over from her point of view and then I think Neil was going to talk about the way people contribute differently not just giving money but the ways that they've contributed um, towards our cause just with what their knowledge and their tasks and skills that they have. Jadida. Yeah, so basically I'm the manager on site at Mercy Rescue in Kitale, Kenya, and um, I manage the center, which is sort of our place where we rescue the babies. They come into the center and that's where um, we decide what their, you know, their story is going to be, what their future will be, um, where they'll go, whether we reunite them with their own family or if we can't find any links to their own family, we then uh, try and place them into a foster family or an adoptive family. Um, our main sort of my passion is to make sure they stay as short as possible at, uh, at the center so that they can be in a family unit as soon as possible, uh, basically where they belong, which in a family where they can be loved. Um, and so we have many different stories um, that come through to Mercy Rescue. Um, so many different, you know, stories of abandonment, why they've been abandoned, the vulnerabilities that they come from. And um, one, one story in particular, I gave, uh, I think there's photos uh, to be, that we can show, um, was of a, a, a baby girl that had just been born and um, she was actually found uh, buried underground. And it was just an absolute miracle that someone was walking by and saw her and um, realized that it was a baby and also a miracle that she was alive. And she came to the center with um, scars down all down the side of her body because um, her skin had been in the ground. I think it had reacted and maybe some ants had got, you know, had been biting her or something. And so she was in a lot of pain and um, very, you know, it was a, few, a couple of weeks where she really struggled she was crying all the time, but um, just an amazing story of just how she was meant to survive. And we got her into her family. Um, she, she was uh, uh, fostered by a local Kenyan family who love her, who, uh, you know, just mother her and parent her, you know, she, as if, you know, her life was always meant to be with them and she was always meant to be loved by them. And um, just, yeah, it's just a beautiful story of how lives can be changed and um, how God works, really how, you know, this baby was left to die, but actually she lives and she's a beautiful child. So yeah, that's uh, just one of the many stories that we have here. And we have many, because as Claire said, we've uh, fostered her over around uh, 250 children and each of them have a story, a tragic story that they come from and just that, you know, God has been in their life to, um, change it and make a difference. So yeah, that is basically Mercy Rescue, what we do on the ground. Shall I share the pictures for you, Jadaya? Oh yes, yes, please, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so this is baby Mad Madeline, as you can see, all down the side of her body is where um, she reacted to 
you know, something in the ground or she was bitten and she was in such pain, such pain. Um, but yeah, and she was just a beautiful baby. And um, yeah, meant to survive and just thank God every day for her life. And her mom is just over the moon um, and loves her so much. And she has such a beautiful smile and yeah. She's just going to be, she's going to grow up to be an amazing, amazing girl. And that's, yeah, there she is now. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Am I on? <laughs> well, okay. Yeah. Um, good evening, all. I'm, I'm, I'm going to talk about Key Church. Um, I'm the uh, treasurer of Mercy Rescue Trust. Um, I became the treasurer as a consequence of a previous chairman um, uh, involving me, twisting my arm at my back. Um, but it was a good, it was a good move. Um, at that point, um, I think Mercy Rescue Trust was relatively unknown to uh, the, to Key Church. I th there were some members that were aware of it, but it was relatively unknown. And I thought it was important that. Um, uh, I made aware, made the church aware, the church family aware uh, of what was actually going on with Mercy Rescue. Um, and as a consequence, there was um, a, a lot of interest. Um, as a consequence of that, we uh, are now part of uh, the mission working group at Key Church. Um, and we're firmly established as a, as a mission, what we call a mission partner. I'm sure that's a term that is used elsewhere um, and we regularly get uh, prayer support um, and now financial support as well that wasn't the case at the beginning I think when I first got involved I think there was the the finances were a little bit dodgy to say the least um, uh, operating from hand to mouth but um, it wasn't just finance that uh, key ch church has brought to the um, party um, a number of church members have been involved. One in particular who has spent many months out in uh, Kenya uh, restoring the house that we purchased some years ago and latterly uh, building accommodation for um, our staff. Um, one of our members, also a trustee, um, a naval officer, took a group of cadets out to Katali a couple of years ago to construct a play scheme uh, for the older children and for um, visiting children. Um, members of other churches have also been obviously been involved, um, being very supportive. Again, spending, I can mention Barbara in particular from another church who spent many months actually supporting Jadida. Um, helping her and previous uh, uh, chair, uh, not chairman, uh, previous uh, managers who have um, had to come home for a while. So that's been very helpful. Um, Claire, uh, Dean's, Dean, Claire's husband, sorry, start again. Uh, Dean, Claire's husband, her, a doctor has been extremely helpful, as you can imagine with children coming into the center um, with medical problems, having that medical support, even from the UK has been helpful as well. Um, very recently, and I, I don't think Claire or Jedida know about this, but uh, I was approached by uh, our intern who wants to start making, um, if possible, connections with the, our youth at Key Church. Um, I'm not quite sure where that's going. And I think that's gonna go on the agenda for our next meeting, uh, Claire, if that's okay with you. <laughs> um, so yeah, I think with, um, with church involvement, uh, there's obviously a lot of opportunity for uh, sharing the burden. And that's certainly been the case with Key Church and others. So yeah, thank you. Thank you all very much. Thank you. That's that's really, really interesting to hear. Thank you. Um, we've just got a time now if anyone has any any questions for 
Claire Neal and Jadida. Um, please type them into the chat box or into the Q&A box. Um, so yeah, if you've got your questions, please pop them in there. I don't see any at the moment, although there, there will be a chance at the end as well. If you think you wish you'd ask them a question, <laughs> there'll be a chance at the very end to, to ask a question if you'd like to. Um, just wait a little bit. No, there's nothing coming in, I don't think, at the moment. But thank you all very much. It's really, really good to hear about that, that link. There's one question just, just come up. Ah, oh, yes, it has. <laughs> Did you know, find out later who the baby's mum was? Yes, uh, sometimes we don't find out any information. There's, we have a social worker who tries and investigate each story um, and tries to see if the, you know, around the village or any other people, neighbours, um, the community know any connections to each child. And sometimes we, we do find them and then sometimes we don't. So um in this particular case we didn't find anyone um connected to her um but sometimes we do find them and and we are able to reunite them back with their own family thank you we've got about um, 15 staff on the ground jadida is that right approximately yeah approximately yeah and um uh we have changed the way that we work during um lockdown because we couldn't actually have all the staff members coming to the center um the proximity and also you know their children uh, we we just couldn't have the mixing during covid so what happened was we just had enough babies that each staff member was able to take uh one home and so we have actually changed our way of working that we no longer really have um a a lot of babies at the centre, just a few, but most of them actually um, are with um, one of the workers in their own home with siblings. And um, it's actually more like a home environment before we actually find foster homes. And as, as somebody asked a question about funding, yeah. um, it's, it's uh, Neil will probably be um, the one as our treasurer to answer that, but we now have to find around 60,000 a year to fund all the staff and the overheads. So it's no mean undertaking, but you know, whenever we've needed money, it's arrived, which I I just feel in my own faith, there's a reason for that, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, and in fact, it's it's more like 75,000 that we need to raise on a, an annual basis. Um, and apart from the donations that come in from the various churches um, on a regular basis, um, most of our funding is through standing orders from quite a large number of donors. Um, that's something that we've tried to promote quite a lot because obviously having regular and regular income is the only way that we can actually do any planning. Occasionally when there is a, a need for a, a one-off uh, expenditure, for example, one of the things that we are looking at at the moment is trying to replace the truck that we have out in um, Katali, which is slowly falling apart. Um, those sorts of things, we will try to do some additional and specific fundraising for, but most of the funding comes in through um, standing orders, direct into our bank. Thank you. Thank you. I think that answers all the questions we've got at the moment. If anybody has a burning question later, though, please just type it in and we'll we'll find it later on. So thank you very much. Um, we're going to go now to uh, Braddock, St. Mary's Braddock in Cornwall and also Braddock Heights in Maryland, both both Braddocks. So we have three speakers. Um, I'd like to say a big welcome to our speakers all the way from the USA. It's great to have you with us. We thought the time difference might be a problem, but it hasn't been. So that's wonderful. So we have Father Gordon and we have Scott from, um, from the USA. And we also have Rob, who's from uh, Braddock here in Cornwall. So again, uh, welcome in whatever order you'd like to speak and let me know when you'd like me to show the video as well and I'll, I'll do that for you. <laughs> okay. I'll, I'll start off and give you a bit of an introduction and then we'll play Father Gordon's video and then it's a free-for-all. Um, 
you remember in November 2019, um, Bishop Philip produced the Saints Way project. And one of the things in that was to get international links. Now, I grew up in Cornwall, I'm a mining engineer. I've been around the world. Um, so based on my experience, I thought there's got to be somewhere called Braddock, somewhere in the world, because there's lots of Truro's, there's lots of Lansons, uh, there's lots of Penzances and so forth. So I thought, well, there's got to be a Braddock. There's got to be somebody from the little parish of Braddock who's got his um, got his donkey and gone off with a gone off prospecting or something somewhere in the world. Uh, his borough. But so anyway, so I, I went on the well, I asked the PCC first, obviously. I went on the um, went on the website and I started looking for Braddocks. And um, we looked around Australia, New Zealand, uh, Canada, and uh, and the United States, and we found three likely candidates. Um, one was a church called St Mary's Church in Pennsylvania, which is just outside of a big steel mill at, at a place called Braddock. Um, that was built in 1905, but is now closed, so that was no good. We went to Braddock. North Dakota. This was with the aid of um, Google Maps and Google Vision to see what was actually there. So we looked looked in North Dakota, and what we had was a rail siding, and it was named after the engineer who built the siding, and it had row after row of grain silos, but no church that we could determine. Um, and then we we looked um, and found this lovely church in Maryland. So we wrote them a letter. Um, and as a result of writing them a letter, they wrote back. And we had a, a really nice letter back. Um, this was now at the start of the COVID um, uh, pandemic. Um, and so we agreed to have a Zoom meeting between our two rectors and all, that, all our church wardens. Um, the result of that was that they very kindly invited us to join their Zoom service every week. And the lovely thing with their Zoom service is after the Zoom service, they have a coffee morning. Now it's a virtual coffee morning and you have to remember to bring your own coffee, but it's a chance to talk to people who have got the same mind as you um, and find out all about their country. And, um, and as we found out about uh, Braddock Heights, we also discovered we had a lot of links. So Maryland um, is from Charles I's wife, named after Charles I's wife. Um, we had the Battle of Braddock Down. Now it's a, an obscure link, but it's there. And it's something in history. In the Second World War, we had the uh, Maryland National Guard stationed in Braddock before the D-Day landings. Um, but we found out lots of more things because Cornish went everywhere in the world. And as we'll discover in a minute on the video, um, we, we discovered some interesting um, joint things there. How it's developed for us is that we've, um, we have joint services. So you remember Alistair Cook's letter from America, many of you. Uh, which are my age, you will. I don't know if you're anybody, anybody younger than that remind, remember it. But we have a lector from America now. Um, and so every Sunday, um, the second lesson of Braddock Church is read by somebody from America. Um, so we have a little video and we show that in the, in the church of that. Um, for Christmas, we had a joint nine carols and lessons service. So half of the nine carols and lessons was done by Braddock, half was done by... Um, Brad, Braddock, so that's right, um, and that was fascinating. We had the school choir singing, and it was lovely to see our school choir singing in America, um, and the kids really enjoyed that. Um, it gives the school an international link as well. Um, so that's where that's where we where we're going, and we've become firm friends. So if we now show the video that um, Father Gordon made. Um, and then we can talk about it afterwards. Okay, I shall do my best to share this. Um, <laughs> <laughs> here we go. 
Here we are. Um, share sound. There we go. Hopefully this will work. Shout if it doesn't. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, there we go. Hello. I uh, wanted to have a chance to, uh, to share my reflections uh, in a more prepared way to begin with uh, and take questions and discuss afterwards. Um, I was composing uh, this, in fact, uh, during a, a clergy retreat recently at one of our clergy centers nearby uh, here in uh, Western Maryland. Um, and I was putting together my thoughts and I realized that probably it was a bit formal, uh, but um, bear with me. And uh, at the end, uh, I hope there'll be a chance to, uh, to have questions and to, uh, for me to, to share with you some more, more reflections about, uh, about our companion parish relationship with, with St. Mary's and Braddock. So uh, I will uh, send, you, send you forth with my, my thoughts and um, uh, we, we can begin there. Greetings to our friends at St. Mary's in Braddock and to the Diocese of Truro in Cornwall from your friends at the Church of the Transfiguration in Braddock Heights in the Episcopal Diocese of Maryland. By way of introduction, I'm Gordon Williams Delovars, Rector of Transfiguration. It remains a special joy for me, among other things, as the Rector, to have the privilege each Sunday to include in our prayers of the people greetings of peace and love to our companion parish in Cornwall. And that joy is shared by all of us here, something we've been doing for a year and more. Let me start by stating sadly what we already know. Since we began our special relationship with St. Mary's, both our countries and the world have faced the ravages of a deadly pandemic. We have lost loved ones and know of many who have suffered loss in their work, their freedom of activity, and their way of life. We may know of many who are still recovering from the ravages and sicknesses brought on by the COVID virus. And we also have needed to close our churches and to refrain for a time from gathering together liturgically, personally, musically, in ways that have always guided and enriched us as the body of Christ. And even now, as things appear to be slowly improving, we may still feel uncertain about what the future holds. All of this is by way of saying how grateful I am for our becoming parish companions and for your diocese fostering of international links that have brought this about. I truly believe God has granted our two churches a unique opportunity in the midst of pain and struggle of this past year to be able to share a common journey, to be invited to strengthen and encourage each other, which we have done. And we still fondly recall the joint lessons and carol service we celebrated with St. Mary's last December. That was special. Even given circumstances that might have dampened our holiday spirits, we remember how the sight of St. Mary's beautifully decorated church and the sound of the combined choirs and the fine lectors and the British accents <laughs> stirred our imagination and brightened the season for us. For that moment, I think, time and place and all those sea miles seemed to vanish, and we became one parish, one community of joy and hope and supporting love. I trust that our companion church experienced something of that same feeling along with us. Both Rob Pierce and Father Paul assure me that they did. Please allow me to add here a personal note, although it's one that Rob and St. Mary's have very patiently heard before. While many in my parish hold a deep regard for Britain and for the British people, I may be the only one who can claim Cornish roots. My grandfather on my father's side was born in Port Scatho in 1888, and his Welsh family had lived for generations in Cornwall and Devon. Both of my great-grandparents are buried in St. Austell, and I've had the good fortune of visiting Cornwall twice, each time returning with treasured memories. 
So, taken together, this all makes for either a remarkable coincidence or a wonderful stroke of providence, or both. <laughs> and we're only just getting started. There are any number of ways in which we can plan to stay connected. Among those being discussed are more joint virtual services, of course, some pre-recorded, and some hopefully that can be live-streamed, as well as sharing personal histories and backgrounds, getting to know each other. It just would be fascinating to know what everyday life is like in our respective counties and districts, as a matter of interest, of course, but also as a way of holding in thought and prayer the life journeys of each other's members. And in light of recent awards given in your diocese to lay leaders for distinguished service during the pandemic, it would be valuable too to learn how our two churches regularly serve the needs in our communities, especially through difficult times. None of this precludes, however, efforts toward meeting in person at some future date. We have talked about this, Rob and I, Paul and I. I have this recurring picture of mutual delegations visiting Cornwall and Maryland, crisscrossing the pond and being wined and dined by the same. Game hens and crab cakes all around. I can tell you at least of one priest on this side of the Atlantic who very much anticipates the day when you can open that churchyard gate at Braddock and walk down that stone path toward that ancient tower and greet those whom he's never met but feels he already knows. And I'm certain that many in my congregation are possessed of the same dream. Thank you. That was lovely. Thank you. I can say more too. <laughs> Very formal. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, welcome. Welcome to say more. Um, <laughs> if you would like to, or, or Scott as well. Um, uh, Scott, uh, Scott, please. Yeah. I will unmute. Um, but first, getting to know Robert and his parish is, is, has just been a blessing to us all. His ideas, he, he has ideas that I don't think of. And, and, and I like to think I'm up to, I, I keep up, but he's hard to keep up with. Um, he recently got a piano. Now, that doesn't seem like much, but, but a piano can be something major if it's something that brings people to the church. And that's, that's what we're doing. We're bringing people to the church. And I, find, I found that whole initiative to be refreshing and invigorating. It made me wonder, how else might I draw people to my church? And, and what, what, might we be, what might we be doing better to serve them? Sometimes the conversations in the uh, coffee hour get stray political. Um, he's been keeping us up to date on the Brexit and the current state of uh, COVID. And we compare notes and we all but cried together last summer and fall and into the winter and the long winter. But over here, we're, we've finally gone to phase yellow. And that means that we're allowed to walk around without masks, provided everyone in the area has been vaccinated with two weeks in and all of the, all of the precautions. Um, we're not quite to the point where you might call it uh, herd immunity, but we're, we're moving along. And my message to you is that there is hope. There, there is hope. It's, it's coming. I'll pass the baton to you, sir. Well, as, as, as I said, my, um, for us, it's been a, a really, ex, I don't know, it, it's exceeded all my hopes. Um, we've learned an awful lot from uh, the folk at the Church of Transfiguration. Um, it's inspired us 
um, to put on even songs. Uh, their music is lovely. They've got um, Scott, his wife, well, everybody I know. I don't know anybody. I've got to know every. I've got to know all these faces on on the on the on the Zoom coffee morning, and every one of them can sing. Um, and it, it, it's absolutely amazing. They can only sing one at a time. So I spent a year of getting to know them through their songs. They had a lovely organist who's just left, and they've got another lovely organist who's just come. And my latest scheme, of my, one of many, <laughs> is to acquire Santana for a year. I think she should come across with Joe Biden, um, whenever it is, next month, and she should stop with us for a year and put our music right in our church. I think that's a... a I think that's an excellent thing, and I'm sure they'd be very willing to part with it for a year. So that, I, we we're just, you know, we have become friends, and it, it is it, it, the whole system has been has been really so worthwhile. And, and all we need was Google Maps and uh, and the will to 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 look around the world to find somewhere with with um, similar names. Yeah. And incidentally, the the Braddock came from General Braddock. It was nothing to do with Cornishman going abroad. It was to do with the Indian War, so uh, French Indian War. So um, so my whole premise was completely wasted. But <laughs> on the other hand, it worked. Thank you. I, I was I was gonna say too, um, especially after that um, deeply moving, stirring presentation regarding the rescue of children. Um, that we are also concerned about uh, the, the issues that, that surround us uh, in our communities. We, uh, we have, a, 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 even in a, in a place of plenty, we have uh, people who are homeless, uh, quite a, um, a, 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 a challenge, an, an issue here in, in Frederick, in Frederick area, where uh, Braddock Heights is attached to. And um, I want to go back to saying that I was so impressed with um, that presentation some while back that the bishop gave regarding uh, the um, uh, distinction of the of the Saint Saint Peter's cross to uh, to those lay persons, um, and that's also very very strong uh, um, piece uh, to this as well. Um, as I mentioned in my 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 address, um, that um, that's also something that we want to explore. Um, how we how we do church, and we know that church is more that more than 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 and a beautiful service, as as lovely as that is, and meaningful and inspiring as it is. We know that uh, our church doors are, are are the ones that open out, and um, and I know that um, from what I saw, what I've seen, um, uh, St. Mary's and and the benefits there all, um, uh, appreciate that uh, deeply, and so that's that's an inspiration for for me. Um, uh, I, I, I wax too romantically about about things. I, it's one of those things where I've just discovered or recently discovered my my uh, my roots, my ancestral roots, and so that's part of what I what I said. I'm I'm very drawn to um, to Cornwall and and Devon for for, my, for family reasons, of course, but um, uh, to the history and the um, the character of the of, of the people. Um, what I've read and 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 know, um, and Rob has been a, an inspiration and a and a joy for us as well. So um, I just want to add add some add some of that to uh, to a more formal presentation and what Scott Scott had said as well. But uh, we couldn't we couldn't be really more more pleased and more grateful for this for this opportunity. It really came out of the blue and it was dropped in our laps, and uh, I, I appreciate that very much. Well, thank you very much. It's it, uh, it's really inspiring to hear of this wonderful relationship that you've clearly built up together between two churches in very different parts of the world. And yeah, it's really inspiring. Um, we have one question that's just come in. How are you affected by COVID as far as meeting in church is concerned in Maryland? What sort of numbers do you have? And are you free to sing and talk in church at the moment? <laughs> it, You're it. It, it's okay. I'm it. Uh, it's interesting to that you asked ask that. We we finished this morning uh, our our time um, uh, with um, the bishops 
uh, every other week, there's a webinar uh, from our diocese uh, to clergy and senior wardens of the diocese. And we have been in uh, designated phases and they've been um, a, red, a red phase, which was, was, was essentially a lockdown. And we, we would be able to do um, uh, streaming and recording of services with just a small number of, of, of uh, participants. And the yellow phase, which has been, been in operation for operative for some, some time, has been uh, allowing for a certain number of, uh, of worshipers to come masked, um, socially distanced, uh, and also by reservation. In other words, how many people we were allowed uh, in our nave, in, in the sanctuary. And um, we are now moving because the numbers in, uh, in Maryland uh, and in our county of Frederick uh, and in the surrounding counties have, have decreased dramatically, uh, uh, great, gratefully to say, um, that we were looking for a yellow phase, which uh, allows us, for all those who have been fully vaccinated, to be able to, um, uh, to gather uh, unmasked. Um, so we still want, want to be some distanced. Um, and the, um, those, who are, uh, those who are unmasked uh, may, also, may also sing. Um, and um, the determination whether that will be uh, with a mask on or, or not, congregational singing, uh, we, are, we are allowed, however, to have unmasked uh, choristers. Um, at, 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 at a certain dis distance, about 20, 20 feet or so. So our diocese has done a really excellent, as, as I know yours has as well, done an excellent job in um, keeping us abreast of, of changes and working with the CDC and other, other agencies uh, on, on that. But right now, as of uh, Whit Sunday, Pentecost uh, Sunday coming up, um, we will be able to um, uh, return on mass um, and, and, and be able to, to have some congregational singing, but pretty much we will have um, a, 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 a soloist or a cantor and perhaps some other, some other uh, members of the choir. Um, but um, the, that the vaccination piece has, um, has really made a great difference, um, obviously. Okay, thank you. Sorry, did you want to add something, Scott? <laughs> um, I heard that, that Maryland is more than 60% uh, um, right. vaccinated at this point. And um, that, that's where I'll stop. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you very much. Really good to hear about this link between Braddock and Braddock. It's wonderful to have you with us. Um, I don't think we have any more questions at the moment, but if anybody else would like to ask something later, please continue to, to write your questions there. But thank you very much. OK, we're going to move on to um, another part of the world again now. Um, Alison and Mark have been waiting very patiently for their turn. <laughs> so we have Alison and Mark who are from Puff Hill um, and they have a link with Zambia through Mission Direct. So um, over to you. Welcome. Thank you very much. Well, hello everyone. Thank you for joining us this evening. Our personal story with Zambia starts in 2015 when we went for a two week mission period with the charity called Mission Direct, which I'm sure some of you are familiar with. Mission Direct sends volunteers all over the world, different places of, in areas of great need and the program is usually to be involved in a, a building or a developing or painting or building a refuge or building classrooms for a school in the mornings and then going out into the community and, and working with the mission partners so you get a greater idea of what's actually happening on site in the country. So we'd like to show you um, a PowerPoint we'll talk through the slides. During our period in 2015 we were supported by our church through prayer and financially. And I'll explain how that support has grown as time has gone on. 
as I said, we first went in 2015 and we have been back every year since, but obviously not last year and looks like unlikely to be this year. But here we are. This is one afternoon in one of the compounds. There are many around Lusaka in Zambia. And we are leading a sing song. I think we're about to launch into head, shoulders, knees and toes here. There are many of these compounds around Lusaka. These children generally are uneducated. They are living in extreme poverty. And we go into the compounds to try and bring them a little bit of joy and a little bit of hope. And as you can see by their faces, they just love when the white people come, when the Mzungus come, they really like to join in with us. You can see the lady in the forefront, Margaret, wearing the Mission Direct t-shirts. We've been very good and we've got our polo shirts on this evening, but you can't actually see the logo. <laughs> but we are wearing them, I promise. Um, and this was one, one of many afternoons and we've been to several of these places. And this is the sad story of what can happen if there is no help offered in the form of educating children within those compounds. This is the flip side of the coin very much. These are young people on the streets. There are many reasons why young people end up on the streets, but once they're there, they don't usually survive beyond their early 20s. They may be orphans from the AIDS epidemic. They may have run away from the compounds because life in the compounds is so difficult. They may have been abandoned there as children or their parents may have been street children themselves and they may have been born on the streets. And we have, during the years we've been going, we have met people with all those scenarios. It's extremely sad. They become addicted to a jet fuel derivative called sticker. And once they're on sticker, it's very, very difficult to, to help them. So it's a harrowing experience and we wanted to get involved such that we could help in a practical way. So during the time we've been going, we've been on several street visits. Mark and I are members of the North Cornwall Gideons, or I should say the organization formerly known as the Gideons. It's undergoing a name change at the moment. Here we are in what is a cafe on the streets with a young man whose name is James. And the reason that we're laughing is we're showing him a Gideon New Testament and he's amazed and delighted to find out that there is a chap in there who wrote a book called James, the New Testament. So um, it's a time of great joy. And we have distributed Bibles on the street for those children who know English. So this is where our story really starts with our involvement with the church. During our first visit, one of the places we went to in the afternoon was a school called Crown of Life School in one of the suburbs of Lusaka. And here we have Dorothy, who is the founder of the school and in the background, her husband, Michael who is the pastor of the church, Works of Faith Church, which is also based on site. It's a very long story as to how Dorothy came to form the school. Um, this is not the forum for it, but suffice it to say, she was looking for somewhere to build a, a larger school in 2009, which is when Mission Direct came on board. And since then, Mission Direct have been sending volunteers and raising money to extend the school. So this is the basic layout of the school. Here we are building, beginning to prepare the, the work for building classrooms. And each year we've been, thanks to the involvement of people sponsoring children at the school, we've been able to help build new classrooms. And there's an example of the volunteers building classrooms and carrying very heavy blocks get the professionals to put the roof on. The mission direct volunteers aren't supposed to climb more than three foot, although you, there's not an awful lot of health and safety in Zambia, as you can imagine. So guys, here's Mark with Dorothy. 
when we went back in 2017, and since then more classrooms have been added. This used to be the pigsty at Crown of Life School. It's now been turned into a reception class and a classroom for special needs children and volunteers over the years have put the murals on the classrooms. Here we are in the school and this is where the church has really helped us. So not only have they supported us through prayer when we've been there, they pray regularly for was the school and then in 2016, when we came out having been there for a longer period of time, I decided that I had to help in some way. I don't know how many of you have been to Africa, but there is a saying that uh, when, you, when you leave Africa, a little part of you stays there. And that was certainly the case for me. And I decided I'd try and help get involved with the sponsorship scheme. So I set up a very small sponsorship scheme amongst family and friends and church members to sponsor children through school. And this is a photograph of the reception children, the youngest children. You can see it's, it's fairly basic, but the classroom is there, they're sharing desks and they have a teacher there. Here we are in one of the senior classrooms that's been built in more recent years. This isn't my photograph, as you can see, because it's last year and they're all wearing masks. The school was shut during lockdown initially, and then the examination pupils were allowed to go back uh, in March, and then the rest of them went back in June. This photograph shows some of the children who are at the school. These children have actually come from a girls refuge just down the road called Vision of Hope which we've also been involved with and they're able to walk to the school now these these girls are sponsored sponsorship pays for the school fees but it pays for the uniform the school bag the school shoes and helps pay the teachers and here we are, this is a very exciting photograph because in 2019, the school had been extended so much that they've got classrooms right up to grade 12, which is our A-level equivalent. And here they are at graduation, as you can see, all having a great time with Dorothy in her wonderful blue suit in the foreground. These are, this is a success story from sponsorship scheme. This is Maggie. Maggie was a street girl. She went to the girls refuge where she was living for a long time when we met her. Her sponsorship through Crown of Life School then led to being sponsored through college and she had a degree in hospitality. She is now working at a hotel in Lusaka and she's been able to leave the refuge and have our own home. So this is a really, really rewarding experience. It doesn't always end like this, but at least if the children have some education, it gives them some hope for the future and lifts them out of the spiral of poverty. This just shows how the school has grown over the years. Um, there are, well, this is 2019. 530 pupils there, right up to grade 12, which is an amazing achievement for a, a community school in, in Zambia. Um, this is also taken last year. This is another charity that helped supply food to the children. So these children have been given one meal a day, which is really helping with the exam results because often the children go to school and they're hungry Dorothy tells me they go to school and they look a bit despondent because of the awful situation in which they live. And as soon as they come to school, their faces light up. So it's a, it's a wonderful thing to see. Now during lockdown in Zambia, Zambia went into quite an early lockdown. The school was closed. This is inside the church, the works of base church is on the same site as the school 
and it serves as a school hall during class times, but also serves as a like a community centre. And here we are showing the distribution of mealy meal, which is a staple diet in Zambia. Mealy meal is a maize derivative that is mixed up with hot water and turned into something called shima, um, which is a common food in many parts of Africa, starch based. I can't say I completely recommend it, but if you haven't got anything else to eat, it provides you with the carbohydrate content. So Dorothy, as the founder of the school, is very involved with dealing, looking after people in the community, um, runs marriage classes and has the young children in, and they're constantly trying to improve the education of everyone in the, in the community, not just the children. So here we are outside the church and the school is in the background. If any of you have been to Africa, it doesn't matter whether your children or adults, they all love having their photograph taken. So um, my friend Janice and I were swarmed by African children who just wanted to be in the photo. Mm -hmm. The most, many of the children are now sponsored, but there are still many who aren't and the parents can't afford the school fees. The sponsorship that the church at St Olaf's has been involved with and friends and family and anybody I can think of far and near has, has helped to provide a lot of stability to the school because not only does it pay the exam fees and the school fees but it pays for the teachers as well and last time when I went Dorothy said to me I can go to sleep now when I go to bed, Alison, because the money's coming in that you've helped provide. I know that I can pay my, my staff. And that means she can have a higher quality of staff. So we are really, really encouraged that the school is going on so well. And uh, my, my email address is <laughs> in case there's anyone out there who has a desperate need to help and would like, um, like to sponsor children or would like to give a donation or something. We did open this up to um, the benefits that we're in now at St Olaf's and we had an amazing response all on Zoom and had a, a, a large number of new sponsors coming forward this last year and some very generous donations. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alison. That's really good to hear. It's great to hear that um, that St Olaf's are really getting to support um, that work in Zambia that, that you've been involved with. Um, that's that's wonderful. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions at this point for Alison and Mark? Um, uh, yes, we have one just come in. Um, are there other churches in Lusaka reaching out to street children? Of course, Tim, Tim goes to our church, so he knows that oh, okay. <laughs> the, the situation is, is perhaps we can just clarify as well that um, so the school that we're talking about is uh, a private school in, in the sense that we will understand it. So it's set up by Dorothy. There's no state support for that school whatsoever. And the children that go there live in the compounds. So most of their parents don't have any jobs. They don't have any money and they live in absolutely appalling conditions. And that's really why the children actually prefer to be at school than to be at home because at school they've got stability they've got discipline they've got food uh, on occasion as well sponsored by other churches there are um uh, it, with regard to the street children that the Alison touched on the, the the hostel that the girls came from there are a number of those around the, the city children that live on the street tend to live on the street in Lusaka it's a bit like going to London if you're living on the street in this country isn't it um but there is a dreadful problem in Africa, obviously, because the social service structure is, is almost non-existent. Uh, the government has much more important things in their mind to spend the money on. And so there's quite a lot of Christian charities that work on the ground, uh, trying to get the children off the street into some place of safety, which may be another family home, but we're really approval of what's happening in Kenya. We work with a, a, a charity called Footprints on the streets in Lusaka. And their, their rule is to get the child into a home, if at all possible, because that is the ideal situation, obviously. 
Um, but yes, there are many other churches from all over the world that, 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 that try to help in that situation. And that particular school, Crown of Life, that we're quite involved in, the church is involved with subsequently, uh, they've just received uh, a huge donation from a church in St Albans, and they're going to build for them a science block and equip it. So that school is going to be something else. You know, last time we were there, two years ago now, Dorothy said, we're going to start a university, Mark. How are we going to do that? <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> so, yes, it's, it's really exciting and it is fantastic uh, to see these children get an education because that is the way to rescue them from poverty. There's no doubt about it. Um, we have another question. Catherine asks, what is the charity providing the meals? I think it's another church. Another church, I think. In the, in the UK, it may mm. well be Christchurch in St Albans who actually helped fund the initial building of the school. They'd had a fire and they wanted, instead of rebuilding, they wanted to build a school in Africa. And Dorothy met the Mission Direct country manager, this is in 2009, and said, I'm, I've got some land, I'm looking for somebody to build me a school. So he, he joined A to B and they built a couple of classrooms and that's how this school started really. Thank you. Oh. Oh yeah, Catherine says she wondered if it might be Mary's Meals, which is a charity that oh, she supports. Yes. <laughs> Listen, I have heard of that at one of the other diocese and things. Yes, okay. it's Mary's Meals, but... Uh... <laughs> yeah. Okay, I don't think there are any more questions, but thank you very much, Alison and Mark. That was really, really interesting as well. Um, thank you. Um, okay, I think we will move on to our final speaker. Um, so, Christine, night um it's always very confusing that we're both called christine we're both part of the diocese international links committee christine is our our chair um so christine and i have both spent many years overseas as, as mission partners with the church mission society or cms and christine's just gonna share a little bit about her experience um hello everybody um, so my husband and I have uh, served as mission partners with Church Mission Society for two periods of time. The first time was in the mid to late 80s, and the second time was more recently, 2014 to 19. Why link churches with mission partners? Well, there's a sort of mutual benefit. The mission partners have a link with their home country, helps them to keep up with developments in the church and on the home front. And... Um, and churches end up with a link and an insight into another part of God's worldwide church, as we've been hearing in different aspects of what the other people have been saying. Um, as the other Christine said, I'll share something of our experience with the Church Mission Society and other may, um, mission agencies may differ in the way that, uh, that they do this, but I can only talk from my own experience. So CMS has a working model of two months home assignment for every year that you're away. And traditionally, this has been three years away and six months at home, but that varies from situation to situation. And our first stint was based on two years away and four months at home because it was a bit of a tough situation and they found people kept going sick in that third year. So it's better to bring them home, give them a break and then send them out again. Our most recent time, uh, we actually took two months every year in the, um, the UK for various reasons. It worked out better to do it like that. So this home assignment is designated as a time for rest and refreshment, retraining if needed, and deputation, which involves visiting our links and um, possibly other speaking engagements on behalf of CMS. And CMS are very good at trying to arrange that a mission partner will have their links in, um, in, in areas rather than scattered across the whole country. So you don't spend yourself, um, find yourself pinging backwards and forwards to all four corners and going back out on the mission field exhausted. So this latest time with uh, CMS, we had eight such links and we were blessed with having some of our links and places where we already had family or friends. So we were able to combine those official visits with uh, family and friend visiting as well. And we personally aimed to see half each year because we were home every year. It meant our, our links saw us every other year. We wrote three official newsletters a year, which CMS sent out to our link churches and to anyone else who signed up for them. And then we also ourselves sent out a monthly update by email to a list of friends and family, including our link churches, 
and we might share an observation linked to the culture that we were living in or to the nature around us like uh, hearing a cuckoo before you heard them here or the birds hopping through the grapevine uh, which was growing outside our living room window we'd add a reflective sentence or two and sometimes an amusing anecdote such as um, early one morning being woken up by our neighbor accompanied by his young son who had a bit of English who said this is an emergency your car has no wheels and sure enough someone had nicked our wheels overnight including the spare wheel they'd left us all of the, um, the nuts including the safety nuts we had very unwisely left the safety spanner bit in the car if we hadn't have done that they wouldn't have been able to nick our wheels but anyway it was a community um, meeting and talking point so um, people from home would update us with the goings on in their churches, in their lives, the sport, major events, and we felt supported in prayer by them, and we were able to pray more specifically for uh, their needs in their lives. We would occasionally send urgent prayer requests, like we had a young student member of our congregation who was diagnosed with widespread cancer, but some of our congregation who knew how the health system worked rallied around and got a second opinion. And in fact, it was a diagnosis of widespread TB, which was eminently more treatable. He was actually very unwell, but through prayer and practical help, God brought him back to good health. And he was very grateful knowing that he was being covered in prayer by people from around the world through our links and other people in the church's links. And actually he's due to get married this summer, which is great. Um, on our home assignment back in the 80s, we went to visit an old lady at home from the church where I grew up in. She was actually the grandmother of somebody I went to primary school with. She couldn't get out and about very much anymore, but she told us she prayed for us every day. And that was very humbling and very comforting to know that someone was dedicated to praying for us where we were. A lot of our churches um, and mission partners find that a lot of the churches would like visits on a Sunday for a service, but this doesn't always work out as possible for various reasons. And sometimes midweek meetings are necessary. And we've done sort of Friday or Saturday night meetings. We've met people over meals. And sometimes after speaking at a service, we've been able to share coffee and meals with people. And it's nice to get to know people more individually rather than just that church there. Sometimes with visits, things don't go quite as we might have expected, like um, one occasion back in the 80s when the organist walked out after the service at which my husband Peter had just preached, taking his girlfriend from the choir with him. Apparently, unbeknown to us, the organist had announced that if anyone else must mention Jesus, he was going to be off. And Peter mentioned Jesus, so he took off. <laughs> it was a bit unnerving for us as we weren't really quite used to this, um, but we think it was a quiet relief to that church's leadership. <laughs> There is obviously a financial aspect of support, but um, for us on this more recent stint, a lot of our financial support came from lots of family and friends generously committing to giving a monthly amount um, and others as and when they could. Some of this was small amounts, some of it was larger amounts. And someone said to us as these offers came in fairly quickly that this was a confirmation of God's calling to us or that our friends and family were very keen to get rid of us. So our official links did also contribute to our financial support, three of them very generously, but a lot of them couldn't actually contribute massively financially, but they contributed in other ways through prayer and things. So don't be put off from having a link with a mission partner just because you feel you can't contribute greatly financially. And from our own experience and those of others in the International Links Committee, the things that we've appreciated have been prayer, letters, when people have been abroad with children, churches have sent small gifts for the children. Sometimes people have visited. A colleague of ours used to be sent to a Christian Women magazine and um, she would read it and then pass it on to me. A subscription for something like The Guardian Weekly, which was an amalgamation of three or four different newspapers, which kept you up to date with world news. And so if you'd like to investigate um, having a, a link, uh, have a look at the webinars on the website that uh, Christine mentioned earlier and she'll send you the links for those um, or can to contact somebody through the from the international committee if you would like more help and again you'll find on the site you'll find the connections for that and when you we've lost your sound Christine I think yep okay thank okay. you <laughs> Um, check with your, your link, how is the best way to link with them? If, for example, uh, your mission partner is in a sensitive situation, there might be 
certain protocols for what you can and can't say. So latterly, we were working in a more sensitive area. And one of our early emails from a friend was, how are you getting on? Are you converting many of the local people, et cetera, et cetera, which was actually something we said, please don't send emails with that sort of wording in, because actually, if people came and asked us, we could tell them about Jesus, but we couldn't go and proselytize. And God did send people to, to talk. So, but um, you just have to be a little bit sensitive. And so therefore stuff about us couldn't go up on the World Wide Web. So it couldn't go in a newsletter if that was going online. But for other people, like for the other Christine who is in Tanzania, that wasn't an issue. And so you, you could be more, you didn't have to be quite so careful about, about things. And with um, the lockdown, with the advent of people being more used to using Zoom, that can um, make a lot of difference to your, to your links if there's, if there's good internet connection where people are, then they can obviously join in more often, perhaps with your your things like the Braddock connection are doing, um, and not just reliant on when people are home back in the UK. And it made a far cry from our earlier experiences in the 80s, which was prior to the widespread availability of internet and social media, and any urgent messages were passed on by the mission aviation pilot up in the air in his plane by radio through to Nairobi and passed on. But now you can do all sorts of things. So life has changed, but uh, yeah. Okay, thank you very much, Christine. That's that's really good. Um, so you know, this just gives you an idea of the different ways in which your church can get involved. We've heard four very different sort of stories this evening of different ways that churches and individuals can get involved with with mission organizations, with other churches overseas and with different charities. Um, and so, yeah, you can do that in your church as well. There's, there's a look into some of those different ways you can do that. Um, okay, so I have a, a question for Christine. Um, what was your weekly routine and did you have recreational activities? And please bring more questions if you have them. <laughs> um, Yes, we did. <laughs> we had um, a weekly routine. Um, the first time we were abroad, my husband was working as a medical doctor. The second time he was working as a as a minister. Um, and, and so that his work was more routine orientated than mine was. Um, the first time I was looking after children at home, mostly uh, the, the second time um, we got involved in various things like uh, prison visiting and um, I was involved a, a lot with music at the church and things like that. And um, what else did we do? Yes, yeah, so recreationally wise, we did actually join a choir, which was quite fun. My husband has a lovely deep bass voice, so he was very popular. I have a less beautiful alto voice, but we still made up the numbers. <laughs> and, uh, and that was good because we met people outside of the church as well as other church members, and they were from all different nationalities. So that, that, was, that was good. And my husband used to go running. I tended to go walking, but he would go running. Thank you. Are there any more questions or if anyone has questions for any of our speakers to finish off with as well? There's none coming in at the moment. Um, OK, well, I would like to say a really big thank you to all our speakers who are here this evening. Uh, it's great to see Jodida still here. It's very late in Kenya at the moment, so we'll, we'll soon let you go to sleep. <laughs> but it's great that you've managed to stay with us for the whole evening. Um, yeah, so thank you all very much. Wonderful to see you. And it has been very encouraging, very inspiring to hear your stories and hear how different churches can work together and link together and different organisations. So it's been great. Um, as we finish, um, could I ask Father Gordon, would you would you like to close in prayer for us before we finish? I would be pleased to. Thank you. Dearest God, almighty and gracious Father, we give you thanks for the church that your son uh, came to found and the church that we, uh, as the body of Christ throughout the world, um, seek to do your will, um, seek to spread the love of our Redeemer um, in all the places that you draw us and you call us, uh, be with us, encourage us, especially in difficult times, especially when 
uh, the work is hard, um, prospect for success uh, sometimes seems uh, far off. Um, uh, give us hope always, give us joy uh, and fill us with, with your supporting love. We ask you now to send us, send us forth um, uh, uh, bound by your spirit, bound by your love uh, throughout the world you made. Uh, and we pray all of these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you all very much. And God bless you all. And God, good, night. good night. Thank you. God bless Britain. <laughs> Amen.